Ko ea, ko ea, te rā maunga e tū maira. A a ko tarana ki pea ue nuku nuku mai, neke neke mai, taku tauaro kikini ae. A a a ke 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 noa, ke 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 noa. E te iti e te rai kua rai mai nei tēnā koutou. E aku rangatira, e aku karanga maa, rarau mai ki tarana ki reo, ki tarana ki tangata, me e nei kupu. Tuku reo, tuku Māori. He wāriki tēnei e horātu aku kupu i tēnei rangi Māori ora. Greetings. In Māori, I have just introduced a statement from an organisation that I've been a part of for more than 30 years. Te reo o Taranaki. We say tuku reo, tuku Māori. Language and culture crossing generations. And by this we mean, if we raise our children in our language, our regional variation of language, Taranaki Reo, they will be more likely to raise their children in that language when they become parents. And that's because our core language, culture and identity is formed during our upbringing. And it's a key part of who we become later in life. It's just common sense, Nera. Straightforward. Well, after 30 years, I can confidently say it's not as easy as it sounds. <laughs> and my talk is about why that is. What are some of the main issues that we've had to deal with? And what are some of the things that we need to do for language and culture to cross generations? But first things first. I didn't grow up speaking Māori. And that was partly due to the fact that our family lived in Frankton, a suburb of Hamilton City, 250 kilometers to the north. You see, our father, Jeff Hond, from Lancashire, England, was in the Air Force, and the Air Force base was in Tarapa. So we lived in Hamilton. But we came back to Taranaki all the time, in school breaks, uh, for tangihanga, funerals, and for big events. The Taranaki identity that I knew and loved was spending time with cousins, eating heaps of beautiful kai together, going to the pa and being on the farm. That was it. The reason we didn't speak Māori wasn't through lack of support from our father. The reason we didn't speak Māori is because our mother didn't speak Māori. Our mother, Patricia Te Waikapuata Matheson, a high-achieving, Taranaki Māori woman. She started work as a teacher, joined the army, became a policewoman, raised six children, went back to teaching, and then on to community work. It can never be said that our mother lacked in determination, but she did all of that without real Māori, without Māori language. And yet her parents, our grandparents, as far as I can remember, they all seemed to speak Māori, except they spoke Māori to each other. That was their world, and we weren't a part of it. This is us. Just arrived in Taranaki, and I can tell that because we're all smiling. <laughs> Uncle Joe, cousins, and our grandmother, our kuia, Nora Te Aruaro o Paritutu Ruakere, and, as I've said, that's me in her arms. But this is where Reo Māori stopped for our whānau. A long, unbroken line of native speakers of Taranaki Reo ended right there. Our kuia didn't speak Māori to our mother, and she didn't speak it to us. And that was the way it was then. Our grandparents' generation, they seemed to have it all under control. But language wasn't crossing generations. Now, to show you why that was, we need to reach for data and go to research that was done in the 70s by Richard Benton and his crew at um, NZCR. Between 1973 and 1979, they conducted a research that was substantial. More than 33,000 people were interviewed in their homes and as whānau. They recorded information about date of birth, tribal affiliations, where they lived, and they gauged people's ability to kōrero, to speak Māori. 
Along the bottom, we have the years that people were born. The vertical axis is the ratio of speakers, and along the top are a sample of tribes and locations that were included in the research. But before we go any further, I really need for everyone to understand that of the people who are interviewed, if they could speak Māori, they had learned their reo in the home and in their communities, not in school. And that's because school at that time, language in that time, Māori language in that time, that was grammar, reading and writing, but not speaking. Hey, te pai? They learnt it in their homes. So, what we're looking at here is when Fano generally stopped speaking Māori to their next generation, to their children. And we see a definite decline of speakers around the time of the Depression and the Second World War. Except, of course, for Ruatoki. It was one of the few places where reo continued well into the 70s. But for the rest of us, our reo was in decline. And there was a lot of reasons for that. Government policy and post-war urbanisation of rural Māori communities that dispersed native speakers. And there was a strong sense of nationalism linked with English after the wars. Speaking Māori in schools, that was actively discouraged because it was seen as an obstacle to progress and to learning. So in 1927, when my mother was born, there was more than half of the communities in Taranaki had stopped sustaining their language. And that's what happened for our mother. That's what happened for her generation. When this information came to light, it came at a time when there was a general political awakening for Māori. 1972, the Māori language petition. In 75, Māori language week. And in the same year was the Māori land march. When the findings were made public, it automatically drew attention. And they were saying... In a very short amount of time, Māori language would cease to exist as a living language. It would continue in archives and in books, linguistically, and possibly in ritual and ceremony on marae, but as living language, it was all over. And that's because of the people they interviewed that could speak Māori, almost all of them were approaching old age and they hadn't passed their language on to their children, well, the majority hadn't passed their language on to the next generation. There it is. That is what happened. Now, in 1972, the thing I remembered is our queer died. Our grandmother passed away, and it, had a, it was a huge blow to our whanau, and it certainly was to our mother, because not long after that, she enrolled in a Māori language course, and when she had done that, she set her sights on us children. We were off to Māori boarding school. Girls, you're going to Hatohoepa in Napier, and boys, you're going to Hatopetara in Auckland. No questions, no arguments. That was a clear sign to us. Things have changed. New game plan, whānau. Mum, with the support of our father, was driving real Māori to the forefront. And tuku reo, tuku Māori was getting back on track. Learning, Māori, learning to speak Māori in schools, that was difficult. We learned to read and write in Māori, we learned to translate, we learned grammar, we learned to pass exams, but even after five years of learning, you could hardly say that I could speak Māori confidently at that time. That didn't happen for me until a few years after I left school. I entered a two-week immersion program in Raglan with Te Atarangi, a community-based Māori language learning approach. And our two pōako were amazing. Our teachers were Katarina Mataira and Peti Manawaiti, two of the best. In those two weeks, I could kōrero. I began to speak. Because all that language was in there, but in a sustained Māori language immersion for that period of time, that language started to flow, and I was inspired. I came back to Taranaki, and I dived into Māori language immersion with Te Reo Taranaki and Te Atarangi. We had a group of elders, our pāke, and a large group of youth, Te Runanga Rangatai, and we got busy. 
night classes, weekend immersion intensives, it was all on. But we couldn't really sustain that level of activity. The community didn't really have the resources to keep up that sort of momentum. And so, together, we approached our local technical institute, at that time, Taranaki Polytech. And in a short time after, we had our first formal tertiary education Māori language immersion class. And it was taught by none other than Dr. Huirangi Waikerepuru, our Taranaki Reo champion extraordinaire. When Huirangi was there teaching, the classes quickly grew, and we quickly got also worked in that area, teaching Reo in immersion. We felt like we had won the trifecta. True. The first one was we got access to resources. I'm talking about facilities, learning and teaching resources, vehicles to travel to our communities to work. And for our students, the next one was they got qualifications. And when they applied for jobs, when those jobs were there, they got them because they had qualifications, but also because they spoke Māori. But the real win for us was that we got to work alongside our real idols, Huirangi Waikerepuru, and a long list of te atarangi, passionate practitioners, experienced Māori language immersion practitioners. They were native speakers. And they wanted to speak Māori to us all the time. That's a trifecta, if ever I knew one. Well, that's where it all started to go astray, really. And that's partly because, as second language speakers, we were so caught up, so, so caught up with what was going on, and I, myself included, I wasn't really paying attention to what was happening out there. I was bumping into our past students and they weren't talking to me. I was thinking, have I done something? Well, it didn't take much to realize they were whakama. They were embarrassed because they had lost all confidence to kōrero. And they met me and they knew the first thing I was going to do was speak to them in Māori. I mean, we were fine. We were in this immersion space day in, day out. But for them, we had given them their qualification and they were off and there was nowhere for them to use their reo. That's a major misreading of a situation. Kind of like language planning 101. We were in a tertiary education institution with a focus on employability and advancing academic achievement. When in actual fact, what we really wanted was language revitalization. <laughs> language revitalization based on the concept of language vitality. That's a reference that talks about the ability of native speaker communities maintaining their language, even though all around them there is another dominant language being spoken in wider society. Native speaker communities, that's what we wanted. So we started to pay, pay attention and notice the works of academics such as Joshua Fishman and Bernard Spolsky. And they were saying that with concerted effort, communities can reverse language shift, can reverse language loss and start sustaining an endangered language again. Being bilingual in localized language is achievable, but it comes down to a simple act and difficult to maintain. It comes down to parents raising their children in Māori language. We refer to this as te tukui hotanga o te reo, and it's a critical part of Māori language revitalization, whakarauoradeo. To do this, well, we have to change the patterns of language use in our daily lives. And that takes planning. L long-standing language habits, they're hard to change because language is largely subconscious, and if you don't have a plan, if you don't set goals, if you don't have rules and expectations, it doesn't take long, and you start slipping back into speaking English again. It takes a lot of work. And some of you may be thinking, all that effort? What is Māori language revitalization actually offering us? Well, I've got four points to make. The first one is that it creates a vision of parents and whānau empowered to make informed decisions about the type of language, culture and identity they want for their children. 
It's about grandchildren and great-grandchildren growing up in an environment where real Māori is sustained naturally as a mother tongue and a living language. It's about saving years of study later in life, paying fees, uh, lost wages, government resources, teaching adults to speak language, when children can cope with multiple languages efficiently and effectively from the time they start speaking. And for regions like us in Taranaki, it gave us a decent shot at retaining regional language by, by supporting communities to develop and maintain re, uh, localized identity through the languages they speak and the cultures they maintain. Now, Eteiwi, this is a tangible vision. And it's totally achievable to bring life back to regional languages, language diversity. But let's not forget and start to think that this is all about language. I made that mistake. Yes, language is important. But if we don't have communities to speak it and use it, it's not a living language. To bring language, culture, and identity back to life, it must cross generations. So to all us parents, <laughs> the ball is in our court. Kōrero Māori ki o tamariki. Raise your children in reo Māori. Tuku reo tuku Māori. I te mea, he Māori ora tēnei e kōrero tiana. Aku hoa, kei ātato, no hora mai. 